Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Crosslink. We're happy to have you guys here this morning. If it's your first time, we especially welcome you here. And uh, welcome to those watching at home online as well. You guys ready to sing? <laughs> Just one person, Greg. <laughs> you want to get up here? You, you want to come here? <laughs> all right. Well, let's, uh, let's stand out and worship, guys. He deserves it all. Let's give it all to him right now.
Let's go to him in prayer, guys. Father, we're so thankful for that promise that death has no hold on me. For those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, by your grace, you have saved us from that grave. We thank you for that, Lord. You are so good to us. And we're grateful, Lord. We're grateful for who you are. We're grateful for what your word says about who you are and what you promised us. We have a hope in that. Distraction that each individual came in here with today. That would be solely focused on your words, solely focused on the words of these songs. And that we hear you today, Lord. Father, we do pray for our country right now. For all those folks that are getting ready to face this hurricane down on the Gulf Coast. Father, just protect them. Keep them safe. All our emergency responders. Father, we pray for Afghanistan, all of our brave soldiers that are over there. Lord, just put your protection over them as well. And be with their families back home as they worry every day for them. Lord, we're just grateful that we can come to you with these prayers and that you hear them. Father, we know you answer them in your time. Lord, just be with every individual here today. Let us hear your word. Let us hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, we love you so much. We praise you. We ask all these great things in Jesus' name. Crossland. If you're new here, my name is Greg. I'm one of the pastors, and we are so glad to have you. Excited as we finish up our little mini series here in Ruth. So, if you have your Bibles, turn me over to the book of Ruth. We'll be in chapter four. Uh, Ruth comes right after Judges, which comes after the Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament. It's been a neat little journey. I encourage you, if you've missed uh, Ruth 1, 2, or 3, to go check out our website. Uh, you can click there and go to our sermon page 
and you can see all the sermons from not only the Roof series, but from previous series as well. I want to draw your attention real quick to the bottom of the screen. That's our connection card. If you look in front of you, you have one of those, you should have one of those in the seat pocket, but you also have a digital one. So at the end of the service, or anytime, honestly, during the week, if you want to uh, let us as a staff know, hey, I want to talk to somebody about baptism, salvation, disciple making, I want to learn more about membership, I have a question about life groups, you're welcome to email us, but the connection card is a great way to do that. So we're here in the book of Ruth, we're in chapter 4. Uh, it's been an interesting journey for, uh, for Ruth uh, to, to be a Moabite, to have Elimelech and his family come, move in, to get married, to watch all the men die, to come back, and then last week we had that you know, little scene with the bare feet and all that stuff, you know, a little scandalous, but we made it through it. So we're going to pick up today, but I want to talk about, and this, is, this has not been an easy story. We, we read sometimes the Bible like it's just ink on a page, and we forget these are real people. We forget that Boaz was an older gentleman who had lived a faithful life, who had a great, great uh, testimony and character in his community, Ruth, all the difficulty she went through, and, and we forget that, that people are messy, that life is messy. You know, I think sometimes we try to feed us ourselves, especially in 21st century uh, Americanism, that life is supposed to go smooth, you're supposed to get everything you want, you know, but it just doesn't work that way. It's messy. And so I was thinking about that. Now, people are messy, and we say that spiritually, but I want to talk real quick about people are just messy, like literally, all right? Now, I have never once lived on my own. So I was, you know, I was the firstborn child, and then I had a little sister, bless her heart, and then I went to college, and I had three roommates, and then I got married and got the best roommate ever. Highly encourage it. It's good stuff. Um, don't marry her. I, she's mine. You got to find your own, all right? Um, but it, it, it's, I've never done that. So what, the living with other people is a challenge because we all have different levels of cleanliness that we're comfortable with. In college, my level was through the floor. Like, it was bad. It was real bad. Like, our, our rule was, we'll do dishes when the last dish in the house is dirty. Claudia's nodding her head because she came to my apartment sometimes. It was gross, all right? You know, I got married. I got domesticated. I'm doing better, fellas. You can, we can make it, all right? But we have different. So I was talking to somebody who's there. They're in a dorm room, and you've got a slob and a neat freak and all this. And what I found is we'll tolerate, at times, cleaning up after ourselves. We don't really enjoy cleaning up after other people, okay? Think about it this way. Maybe if you have children, maybe you experience this. I doubt it's just my kids. We'll get the, hey, you need to clean up this, this part. Here's your job. But I didn't make that mess. Oh, yeah, my children do that. And, you know, uh, I picked on Joseph last uh, the service. He's not here right now, so Meredith's over there. Wave, Meredith. Hey. If you're a preacher's kid, just know you, your main purpose in life is sermon illustrations. That's all you exist for. That's it. That's your. So Mary does this, and we do it. Here's what I do, because I love being a dad and saying dadisms. And she'll say, but I didn't make that mess. And I was like, oh, well, let's play that game. Your mama will only clean up. I will only clean up the messes we make, and you clean up all the ones you did. You can do your laundry. You can do, oh, no, never mind. I'll, I'll clean it up. You know, but this idea of, we have this idea that I, I might clean up my mess, but I don't like cleaning up others. Let's look at my favorite way to communicate, because I am a millennial. I am. I'm 81. I'm holding on tight, all right? I've got 31 days left of my 30s. Not that I'm counting down or anything, but I'm a millennial hanging on. All you Gen Zers out there, you can have your stuff, but I love my memes. Let's look at this one. You know, oh, I just love cleaning up after everybody else, said no one ever. No, I love this one. This is the Kermit the Frog one where you're debating with yourself. Me, I should really clean up after myself. Also me, but why? Someone else will do it. That's dark. Or this one, I love this one too. Making a mess of things and then leaving it for someone else to clean up. Oh, I love this picture. Real quick, before we move on, do anybody know where this picture was taken? Yeah, right here in Mebane. All right, uh, near downtown. Her name is Zoe Roth. I'm just curious. Does anybody know Zoe? Remember her? She lives in Atlanta now. She's in her early 20s. Zero. Okay. Um, th thanks for making that part of my sermon great. Oh, my goodness. Ah. But no, this is a controlled fire by the fire department, and uh, her dad just had me taking pictures and caught this devious little grin, like I did it, you know? But we do that. Like, we'll make a mess, and then we'll, you know, just kind of leave it alone. And then the final one, for all my office fans out there, someone will clean up after you. False. If you make a mess, clean it up. And I, I want to leave this here for a second, because th this is kind of our mentality when it comes to that. I'll clean up my stuff, but you've got to clean up your own. And we talk about that with laundry, dishes, whatever. But sometimes 
that's our mentality with other parts of our life. Our emotions, our spiritual battles, our, our failings, our shortcomings. Look, you take care of yourself, I'll fix myself. And the truth is both are wrong. We're not islands where we don't help other people, but we're also not able to fix ourselves. Listen here and very carefully. If you get nothing else from the day sermon, get this. If you were able to fix yourself, Jesus would not have died for you. Every single person in here, every single person watching at home, every single person that's ever lived on this earth outside of Jesus Christ is a broken sinner who deserved death and hell and needed to be fixed by Jesus. But we need to take that love of Jesus and share it with others. So our big idea for today is this, is that we have a God who is willing to redeem us no matter the cost. I think this is, this is huge because I think different people struggle in different ways. The truth is we're all sinners who need Jesus. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And if you'll submit yourself to him, he will give you a new heart. He'll give you a new purpose. And he will begin to grow in you through the Holy Spirit character and emotions and, and desires and abilities that you couldn't do it of your own. But sometimes we live in the extremes. Sometimes we live in this extreme over here where I don't really need Jesus. I'm a pretty good person. And we do that usually of one way. We find people who are way worse than us and compare ourselves to him. Well, at least I'm not so-and-so. At least I'm not that person. And God says, well, here's your, here's your bar by which you judge yourself on this planet is the life of Jesus Christ. And if you fall short of that, then you're a sinner. Or we go over here to the other side, and it's we're too much of a sinner. God, if, if God knew, and I've heard people come out of this, if God knew half the stuff I'd done, he'd never love me. Here's the greatest news ever. God knows everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever thought, and he loves you regardless. He just doesn't want to leave you in your sin. He wants to redeem you and bring you out. And he is willing to pay any cost possible. And we're going to see that today. We're going to see in this really cool picture in the book of Ruth in chapter 4 about redemption. So grab your Bibles. Let's take a journey back to ancient Israel through Ruth chapter 4. The scripture reads, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, ah, but the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I've bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and renowned in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, 
who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nation. Nation fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Help us to take it seriously. Amen. So here we are in this very strange, very cultural situation. I mean, we're, we're taking off shoes. We're buying wives. Man, there's a lot going on here. So if you're here and you're a real estate agent, I doubt you've ever had to deal with something quite like this. But it's very cultural, and it's very Jewish. And for us, we're like, okay, man, this, this book is weird. First, we got the bare feet in the middle of the night. Now we got some dude taking off his shoe. And what's going on? Let's walk through this a little bit. Let's look at what a kinsman redeemer is, what's also called Leverite marriage. All right? So this is what the, we have the redeemer. God spared this man because he acted very ungodly and did not give us his name. He's simply known as the redeemer. And we have Boaz. And they are talking about the responsibility of a kinsman redeemer, of the next man in line to step up and to marry a widow who has no sons so that a son could be born to perpetuate the name of the dead husband. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 5. So Deuteronomy is the last book of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the law, if you ever heard it called that. And so this is the law concerning the kinsman redeemer. And it says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, so that his name may not be blotted out of Israel." And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, shall pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall, and excuse me, she shall, she shores by the sea shells. She shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if there was a foot fetish in the Old Testament or what. But it gets a little weird. I'm just kidding. There wasn't. All right. But no, so here's what's going on. This was not just some legal transaction. The kinsman redeemer would be the little brother or the cousin, if there were no brothers, the next man, uh, unmarried man in the family would step up, marry the widow, and, they'd, and they, when they had a son, the son would carry the name of the first, dead husband. He would be the inheritor of all that. So this is, I mean, it, it, it's, it's very unique. It's almost like a stepfather role, but to your own biological child. Like it took a man to really trust God and love his family to step up and do this. And we see the law even says, here's what to do when someone refuses. All right, because we know what's going to happen. Here's how my, my brain works, because it's a little different and give you a little peek into between my ears. I wonder... When it came time for mate selection, and you know, if maybe you arranged marriages were kind of normal, and you got the, you got, you bury off your firstborn son first, are the little brothers like checking her out? Like, you know what? Dad, 
pick him a pretty one, because if I got to do this whole kinsman redeemer thing, you know, I don't know how that works or not, but in my mind, that's what would happen, you know, and, and, but this is a big deal. So when we talk about, I mean, if you, if you take it out of context, it sounds like he bought himself a wife. That's not what's going on. But what we see in the book of Ruth and what we see throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament and in life today, there are two truths that I want to see about loving people. Two things I want us to take away from today. The first is loving people is usually messy. And honestly, as I look at it, I probably should have taken off the word usually. Okay, that was just a soften the blow. Loving people is messy because we're messy people. All right, we're going to make bad choices. We're going to be selfish. We're going to be arrogant. We're going to be lazy. We're going to be workaholics. We're going to be rude. We're going to be all these things at different points in our life. And it's difficult. I don't care what it is. I don't care if you're talking about a marriage. I don't care if you're talking about a parent, child, brother, sister, a friend, coworkers. It's not easy to love people. Because loving people is rarely convenient and it usually costs us something. Our culture loves the word love. It does. It's a great word. We use it all the time. We we don't use it very well. Okay? The same word I use to describe how I am committed to God. I use to commit it to my wife. I love how I'm committed to you. I I, I talk about how I'm committed to, you know, cookie dough ice cream. I love all those things. You know, we use the word. We've almost undefined in our culture. But one of the things that kind of seeps through our culture is love is something that brings me joy. We talk about loving something because of what it can do for us, not about our commitment and responsibility to something. Biblical love, we're talking about our willingness to commit to a responsibility to someone, some nation, some idea, some job, to something. That's what the word love means. So it usually costs us something. Let's look back at uh, Ruth chapter 4. Looking at verse 3 and 4, so Boaz is saying to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Now, so this is right now, in the Redeemer's mind, a real estate transaction. Now, I don't know if anybody in this room or listening online is trying to buy land right now in Alamance or Orange County, but good luck. All right, because if you can find it, it's incredibly outrageous. It's just difficult to come by. So when the opportunity strikes, and everybody's got a story. You know, I grew up in eastern North Carolina around uh, Lake Gaston. Anybody ever been to Lake Gaston? It's a unique lake in the sense that there's a house almost on every square inch of the shoreline. You know, I, I haven't seen hardly any other lakes like that. And the reason is, is because the, when the dam was built, it was written into the contract, the state law, whatever, that the water level was, was, it was very narrow. So if you ever go to like the, the Car Lake or Kerr Lake, depends on where you're from, and it might be real low, Lake is not going to get that way. So the flood line is really low. Everybody in my hometown has a story about how they could have bought lakefront property in the early 80s, late 70s for like two grand. And now there are lots selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars with nothing but trees on it. Houses selling for over a million dollars. Everybody had that one chance. So the dude is looking at a real estate thing. So... He says, buy it in the presence of those sitting here, in the presence of the elders of my people, if you'll redeem it. But if you'll not, let me know that I may know, for there's no one besides you. In other words, if you're not going to buy it, I'm going to buy it. And so the dude says in there, I will redeem it. I'll buy some more land. I'll make my empire bigger, my family business bigger. Man, this is a great opportunity for me to expand my stuff. Then Boaz says, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi... You also require Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because here's what happened. He'd have bought this land that has been neglected. He'd have bought this land that hasn't had a lot done, remember, because the limit was gone, and he's got to put resources into bringing it back up. Then he's got to father a child with Ruth, and for, let's just say, the boy gets it when he's 18. For 18 years, he's got to put the expense into bringing this thing back up and building it up to hand it off to what would be Ruth's son by him in the name of Malon, the dead husband. So he's going to lose. It's going to cost him something. It's going to cost work, sweat. It's going to cost equity, money, time, all these things, and he's not getting return. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I love what he says because he lies through his teeth. He says it twice, I cannot redeem it, I cannot redeem it. He could have redeemed it. 
And we could have not be talking about Boaz, but we could talk about this man. But what he really meant was, I don't want to do it. I'm not willing to do it. Now, Deuteronomy 25 does not speak very highly of the man who refuses to do the, the, the job of kinsman redeemer. So this guy is, doesn't care. I'm not worried about the law. I'm worried about my own self, my own stuff. I'm not going to do it. And so we see that. We see this is, this is what happens. And then, you know, he says, take my right of redemption. Says, Here, you take it. You do it. Don't we love pushing responsibilities off on other people? We do. Some stuff we want for ourselves. And can, 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 we, can we be real for half a second? The, most, the number one responsibility that a believer is willing to push off on somebody else is sharing the gospel. We have all kinds of excuses, right? Well, I, I'm, I don't have the personality for it. Um, somebody else is better at it. I'll never be a Billy Graham or that's for pastors. You know, so uh, they did a survey about, about 10 years ago of Southern Baptist churches. And Southern Baptist Convention is supposed to be one of the most evangelistic, you know, Bible-believing, gospel-sharing groups in America. They found that in the last 12 months of survey, only 2% of people who attended the Southern Baptist church had actively shared their faith with someone. I think too often we're willing to say, well, that's somebody else will do it. They can do it better than me. I don't, I don't have the time. It may. We'll talk about it in just a second. But remember, your job as a believer, your, your blessed responsibility is not to be a judge to condemn or, or rule over someone's salvation. It's not to be a lawyer to convince them. It's to be a witness. Share what Christ has done in the Scriptures and also share what He's done in your life. That's all you need. All right. So we see this picture of this guy who loves the idea of redemption when he's getting something, hates it when it costs him something. I'm grateful that, see, let me say it this way. I have 100,000% confidence that the moment my heart stops beating, I'm going to be with the Lord. That is not because I'm a pastor. That is not because I'm a good person. It's not because I do what the Bible says. It's because I know who God is and what he has done for everyone. My faith is not in myself or my abilities, it's in the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 5. I, just, I mean, the book of Romans is, 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 is amazing. But this, this picture right here, For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows us his love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. One of the greatest lies of Satan is, is the two extremes we talked about earlier. Either you're good enough where you don't need Jesus' redemption or you're so bad he doesn't want to give it to you. They're both false. The truth is every person in this room, every person on this planet is a sinner who needs Jesus and he loves you. He's already died for you. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to fix, you know, as soon as I get over this problem or this depression or this anxiety or this addiction or this bad relationship, then I'll get, my, I'll get myself straight and then I'll come to Jesus. Absolutely not. That's like saying, I'm going to get myself real healthy before I go to the doctor. Makes no sense. No, it, it's the idea here is that God, not only does he love us, is he's done the single greatest act of love the world will ever know. Because he says, there are people who will die for other people. If there's someone you love, I, I, I would assume, all right, let me talk to dudes out there. Dudes, if you're married, if you've got a mama, if you've got some, some woman in your life you love, I, I think in your heart you believe you'd die for her. You know, I think that's something God has given us. Ladies, same thing. For your children, for your husband, give them the opportunity. And I like to think that. I like to think, give them the opportunity. If I had to choose between me and Claudia, then I'm gone. If I choose between me and my kids, I'm gone. I'd like to believe in the heat of the moment that if one of you were, were stepping out in front of a bus, that I would jump out and try to save you, risk my own life. I'd like to believe that. I don't know what I'd do in that situation. Here's what I do know a thousand percent. If it came down to your life or my child's life, I'll see you in heaven. The list of people that I'm willing to let my kid die for does not exist, okay? God, in his great love for us, took his only begotten son and hung him on a cross for us. There is no greater love, and it's already been done. This isn't conditional on you doing anything. He's already done it. And he loves you because God loves messy people because that's the only kind of people there are. Let's look at Matthew chapter 1. Right here, uh, you can flip to it in your Bibles or it's on the screen. This is the genealogy of Jesus. Now, let's all be honest in here because Jesus is watching. How many of you skip over genealogy sometimes? 
It's so and so, we got so and so, we got so and so, we got so and so. It's a lot, but don't do that because there are nuggets in there. Like we remember Nehemiah earlier in the year, we did that whole list of names. There were some nuggets in there that we got to see. There are some really cool things in here. So this is the genealogy. We have the ancestry of Jesus from Adam to Jesus. Okay. So here we have, we start with Abraham, great Abraham. Like I said, sometimes we don't, we don't think of the people of the Bible as people. We think of them as just you know, words on a page, or we glorify them. Like Abraham was an amazing man of faith. And he was, but he's also a messy sinner. When, they, when God first found Abraham in the land of Ur, which is modern-day Iraq, he was an idol worshiper. Matter of fact, his family made idols. And God says, hey, I'm going to, um, you're really old. You're like in your 70s or 80s. I want to give you a kid, and I want you to hang uh, west and just keep trucking until I tell you where to go. And I'm going to bless you and, and your children and your children and your children, just like the song said, you know, lots and lots and lots. Matter of fact, he said, through you, Abraham, I'm going to bless every family in the world. That was the promise of Jesus. But Abraham, not only was he a pagan idol maker, when he gets to Egypt on this journey, he lies to Pharaoh and says that his wife Sarah was his sister because he's afraid. Not only that, when it's been a few years and they haven't had a kid yet, he goes and gets himself a girlfriend beyond his wife to have a child and has to deal with all kinds of stuff that, that, that breaks out. Tamar, all right? Tamar is an interesting character. This actually is another picture of kinsman redeemer. She married one of the sons of Judah, who are the, one, the fathers of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Tamar's husband dies. And the situation is kind of crazy. There's a lot going on there. But in the end, she poses as a prostitute in a little hut by the side of the road and seduces her father-in-law. That's a little messy. All right? A lot going on there. All right? But here's the neat thing. Real quick, that's the, um, her, her son is Perez. And remember that. We'll come back to Perez in just a minute. All right? Then we got Rahab. Rahab is a, uh, a prostitute in Canaan in the city of Jericho, and when, when the Jewish spies come in, she hides them, and God saves her from the city when it falls. So the, the Bible is full of messy people, because that's outside of Jesus, that's the only kind of people that exist. So if you're here today, I'm 100% sure you're messy. One form or the other, your mess may be better hidden than others, but we're all messy people, and God loves you. So loving people is usually messy, minus the usual. The second thing I want to see is that loving people has ripple effects. You know, loving people has ripple effects. So what we see is that loving people not only affects who we love, but it also affects those around us and future generations. I like, I like movies, love movies. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite movies is Gladiator. All right, a little gory. If you don't like gory, don't watch it. But I love Gladiator. You know, and then you got Russell Crowe as, you know, he is Maximus Decimus Meridius like a man's man. You know, at the beginning of the movie, he's riding his horse, you know, well, a little manlier than that, but he's riding his horse and he goes, you know what he says? He looks at his troops and he says, what you do in this life will echo for eternity. Whew, I mean, that's good stuff. Now, he's talking about chopping off some barbarian's head. And he's just trying to get his troops fired up. But he hit a big truth. The stuff we do in our lifetime echoes for eternity. We affect generations and generations. I mean, I mean, some of you are here because you had a great, great, great grandfather or maybe a parent who left their homeland and came to America looking for something different. Some of you are here because you had a grandfather or a grandmother who daily read the Bible and taught her kids that, and you're here. Some of you are here, and your family history is kind of messed up. You come from a jacked-up family. That's okay. We just read about some jacked-up families in the Bible. So is, we need to know where we come from, but what's more important is where we're going. Because it affects us. I like to say it this way. In America, in our culture, we tend to live in a fishbowl. And what I mean by that is we usually see about this far in front of our face. We're usually concerned with our immediate needs and wants. I mean, just some practical things. One, our, our culture is terrible at saving money. We're really bad. Two generations ago, you know, the, um, the greatest generation, they saved $2 for every $10 they made. The last time I looked at the numbers here, we, we spend $11 for every $10 we make. 
We just don't, we don't think about that future. Like, oh, you know, we think about we're going to live forever, and we think, you know, and not until you get up in age, you start thinking about it. And, and then, in some ways, it's more difficult. It's not too late, but it's just more difficult. I want you to start thinking about it now. So I've got three kids. They are 14, 12, and 10. I typically don't think about grandchildren yet. How many of y'all are grandparents? Yeah, I can tell you're just beaming. You know, y'all are just, y'all are sick, y'all. You know, you get your pictures. And it used to be, it used to be like this. Used to be, I don't have my wallet on me. Used to be they pull out their wallet and they show like five or six pictures. Oh, no, 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 no. We got them high-tech grandma and grandpas now. They done figured out that smartphone and they've got 6,000 pictures of the babies. Oh, look at this one. Look at this one. Look at this one. And you ever seen an ugly baby, but you can't say that? Be careful. They exist. Not here across the, all oh, y'all babies are pretty. But They exist. But I've got to have the mentality at my age, at my kid's age, I've got to be thinking about my grandkids. When I'm training up my son, I'm not just training him how to be a middle schooler. I'm training him how to be a young man and a middle-aged man and how to be a father. And I've got to think beyond myself. And that's really, really hard. Because, again, fishbowl myself. No, it has consequences. Let's look at uh, in Ruth chapter 4 where we see this. I love this passage here, verse 11. Then all the people who are at the gate and the elder says, we are witnesses. Now, there is a legal ramification here. They're declaring, we are recognizing this, uh, this real estate exchange. We're recognizing this promise of marriage and this uh, uh, acknowledgement of the role of kinsman redeemer. But they're also recognizing the people who they are of Boaz and Ruth. And those two people were known throughout that community for their character for their willingness to take a stand, for their willingness to do what was right. And notice what it says there. May the Lord make the woman, make Ruth, who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. Real sidetrack, I, I didn't do this. I challenge you, go back, read Ruth 1 through 4, and r- mark every time they say, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite, Ruth the Moabite. They're not doing that to put her down. They're doing that to remind you, God loves you no matter your nationality. This is a Moabite. You don't, I mean, you don't understand it. I mean, this is, this is like clashing. These are, these are people groups that do not get along. And these Jewish women are looking at her and saying, may you be like the mothers of Israel. Why? Because they saw in Ruth a faith in God, and that's all that mattered. It didn't, didn't matter if her skin was darker or lighter. It didn't matter if she spoke with a different accent. They noticed, they noticed her faith. Verse 12, and may your house be like the house of Perez. The child who was born in one of the weirdest circumstances ever is heralded as a godly man who was the head of his household. So I don't, I don't, I don't know your family situation. I don't know where you come from. And, and I, I care about you, but that doesn't define you, okay? If you came from a broken home, that, that doesn't define who you are. It's part of your story. It does not define who you are. So as, as we look through this, we see this idea of being a witness. And again, you're not a judge. You're not to declare, you're saved, you're not saved, you're saved, you're not saved. No, you're not a lawyer. A lawyer gives reasons, tries to argue someone, either this person is guilty or not. You are a witness. What does a witness do? Here's what I saw. Here's what I've read in the Bible. Here's what God has done in my life. I think the, one of the best things, uh, excuse me, not best, one of the most powerful things Satan does is convince you you're not a witness. Your story doesn't matter. That's not true. Your story is a story of grace and redemption. If you're a believer, I don't care if it's one of those dramatic testimonies you hear at summer camp or as I was raised in the church and God saved me at the age of eight years old and I've been not perfect but faithfully walking with him for X amount of years. It's God's story in you. So continuing on in the story of Ruth, we see that it affects the people around you immediately, but we also see that it affects future generations. Now, uh, I, love, I love this concept. Because obviously, if you've been around me more than five seconds, I'm, I'm probably talking about making disciples. Uh, the Holy Spirit grabbed my heart about five years ago and just wrecked me and says, Greg, you're supposed to make disciples. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And so it's been a, a really an amazing journey. We use G3 simply as a tool to do that. But here's what I've learned. Every single person on this planet is a disciple maker. Every single person in this room, every single person watching at home you're making disciples of something because people are watching you. Your coworkers are watching you. I don't care if you're a Christian. I don't care if you're a Muslim, if you're Jewish, if you're an atheist. I don't care New Age, Church Sign Time. I don't care. People are watching you. They're going to see what you do. And if you say, I stand for this, oh, that's what that is. 
Oh, that's what, I'm a Christian, that must be what a Christian is. They're watching. Now, that's not to put pressure on you. That's just to open you up to the reality, especially if you're around kids. I don't care if you're a teacher or a parent, whatever, because kids are going to watch you, and they're going to pull a clean Eastwood on you. They're going to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right? They're going to see it. They're going to repeat it. And do y'all ever play this game? I mentioned it before, but you play the game when the kid does something that's uh, not necessarily wrong, but aggravating or something. You blame the, your other spouse. Like when my kid makes a derpy joke, my wife looks at me and goes, that's so you, Greg. I'm like, Ugh. Yeah, it is. And I, I can't deny it. And my wife has no flaws, so I can't blame anything on her. But we're moving on. Um, no, they're always watching, and we're, we're teaching them, and we are even subconsciously, or that you've been affected by your great-great-great-great-grandparent, even though you may never know their name. And this is what we're, we're learning in uh, chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Now, these are the generations of Perez. We're back to him. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Amenadab. Amenadab fathered Nation. Nation fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David, the king of Israel. Now, Boaz, and we, we know the story. If you've been in the Bible, you know, you know the story. You know that Boaz is the great-grandfather of David. You know, Boaz had no clue. Boaz didn't go into this going, man, I'm going to marry this. I got my name in the Bible and all this. He had no idea. Ruth had no idea. They're just being faithful and God used it. Some of the most important lessons that my parents taught me were intentional and some of them were not intentional. What I mean by that is there are times that my dad sat me down and goes, Greg, here's how you do this. You do X, you do Y, you do Z, bada bing, bada boom, here it is. But a lot of the lessons I learned from my parents, I just watched them. I watched my dad uh, go to work at a paper mill, working swing shift. Uh, at the time, it kind of bothered me because on Saturday mornings when he worked night shift, I had to play real quiet, and it kind of frustrated me. And then as I got older, I realized, wait a second, this isn't my dad's dream job. He didn't sit in fourth grade and go, I want to work swing shift at paper mill. But no, that's what he did to provide for me and my family, and what he did. And that was a great lesson I've learned. He never sat me down and goes, boy, this is the reason why I work swing shift. No, but I saw that. My mom, the same thing, how, how she cares for people and looks after people. And these aren't lessons they sat down and goes, Greg, you have to do this, this, and this. But I watched them. People were watching Boaz and Ruth, and they learned. People are watching you. You've watched people. It's all over the place. I love uh, Hebrews 12, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. This follows Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so easily, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, this is, a, this, is a, a, this, is like a, this is like a pump up jam verse. This is like, let's go, all right? We got a great cloud of witnesses, which I think means two things. One, biblical heroes, okay? Read chapter 11 of Hebrews. It's all about the Old Testament, and it's by faith. By faith. Not by good looks, not by strength, not by intelligence. By faith, he did this. But I think it's also us. I think we exist today, the church exists today, so that we can be witnesses to each other, to encourage each other as we're running the race to cheer but also to help us when we fall. Too often the church doesn't do that. Too often we like to cannibalize our own. When someone falls or slips into sin, we just you know, look down our noses at them. Instead, we should pick them up. And I love how in this great victorious verse, we're reminded that we're sinners who need Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So our big idea is this, is that we have a God who is willing to redeem us no matter the cost. He's already paid it. There's not a question of, is he, could I, maybe. It, the answer is set. Jesus loved you, he died for you, and he wants you to follow him. So if you're here today and you've never placed your faith in him, then your next step is simple. It is to trust Jesus. Romans 10, 9 is, a, is my favorite verse to, to answer this question. How do I be saved? Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not be a good person, not show up at church, not put money in the plate, not go on mission trips, not teach uh, kids ministry, not go to a life group. Those are all good things. To be saved, we place our faith in Him. Or if maybe you're here today and you've done that, then what we're talking about today probably isn't new information. It's just a reminder. I need reminders. I'm assuming you need reminders that loving people is messy. I'm messy. That I don't love people because of who they are or what they can do for me. I love people because Jesus loves them and He died for them. 
And I don't want to see a lost world go to hell without knowing who Jesus is. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and its power and its majesty. Father, for anyone here today who's not placed their faith in you, I pray that the Spirit would move and draw them to you. For those of us in this room who have placed our faith in Christ, that we would surrender daily to you, that we would deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I appreciate your attention. I do, again, want to remind you about the connection card right there in the seat in front of you on the website. If you fill one of those out, we're going to follow up with you. We're going to help you on any of those categories there. We just we want to be able to walk beside you and help you on the race that we're all called to run to be a witness beside you. Guys, we appreciate you and your attendance and your faithfulness and your serving and all that you do. But just, you know, we, we say it week after week, but we really do. We just appreciate your giving and your willingness to do that and what we're able to do here at Crosslink because of that. And just remind you how there are boxes on each door on the way out. You can drop in a physical uh, donation. You can go to our website, crosslinkcares.org, and give online is right there. Or you can text this number, and they will send, uh, it'll automatically send a link to your phone, and you can go do it through there. Guys, appreciate you. Pastor Ken's up here. He's got a couple announcements to share before we head out. Thank you so much, Pastor Greg. Great job this morning. Thank you for the word and uh, the encouragement in the word. I just wanted to mention a couple of things to us this morning, and then I'm going to hand it off to JP. She's got a couple announcements as well. If you are interested uh, in going with us to Israel, I'll be leading a trip back to Israel uh, in December of 2022. And uh, we're starting early, getting uh, the ball rolling with uh, fundraising, encouraging you how to do some of that, as well as meeting tonight. Uh, we're going to begin tonight with an interest meeting. Uh, if you are, you've already paid your deposit, then I want you to come. If you have an interest in going, but you've not paid the deposit, you just want to know more, uh, then I want you to come. If you think, hey, someday I would like to go to Israel, uh, then come and you can hear some of the things and see some of the pictures of where we're going to go, and we'll talk about that. So come out tonight, 630 at the Ministry Center, and uh, that's right beside of Buffalo Lanes in downtown Mebane, and we would love to talk to you about the trip. The other thing is life groups. Uh, this is our last week for registration in life groups. Uh, next Sunday, I'll be starting a series in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 95% uh, of our life groups will be talking about that when they meet. We'll be unpacking that even more. And uh, so it's, it's really important that you look and go online this week and find the life group that's the best fit for you. And uh, usually that has to do with the time of the week or uh, proximity to your home. And so we encourage you to go ahead and do that this week. Uh, go on our website and register for a life group. JP has a couple things, and then we're going to dismiss. All right, guys, we're excited. Our next milestone is coming up, and it's called the first day of school milestone. This is for our kindergarten families. And since we didn't, um, weren't able to do it last year because of COVID, we're also going to invite our first grade families as well. So this milestone is a way to partner with our church. And basically, we just come together for about an hour. We walk through God's word, and we talk about what does it mean for your child to start academics when most of their day is now focused on learning math, reading, science, history, how do we still plug God into that? Whether it's homeschool, private, or public, what does God's word say to us as parents? And then it's nice because you get to see other parents that are in that same age group that have kids your age, and kind of, it's almost like a mini little life group right there happening. And that's September 11th. We're going to have a registration that goes out. It will be on our website under the kids ministry page under milestones, and we're going to send an email to our kindergarten and first grade parents. We invite your kids to come too. They're going to be with Miss Molly in the back learning about um, God's truth and why school is important. And then we're all going to come together and pray over their school year. And then the following Sunday, they come up on stage, kind of like we do a baby dedication, and you get to um, show the church, hey, my kids start in school, let's all pray together. And they receive a Bible storybook as well. So that's very exciting. Look for that if you have a kindergartner or a first grade student. And then Awana is starting September 12th. Uh, we launched our registration last Sunday, and within 36 hours, one of our groups was already full. So that was amazing, but also not great because I want to let every child come. We have a wait list right now, so that means I need more adult volunteers. So on Sunday nights from 5 to 6.45, we meet, we sing and dance, we 
Um, we have a Bible lesson time that's already taken care of. What I need is um, volunteers that want to come in and walk with groups of kids from station to station and build relationships with them, help them practice their Bible verses, let them show off what they're learning at home because Awana is, in my opinion, 75% at home, 25% on Sunday evening. So most of the work is done with parents at home during devotional time. They come in Sunday night ready to share what they learn. We also need listeners. Listeners are people who just um, come that night, nothing in hand, just ready to sit and have kids come up and recite scripture to them. And we, with, you know, let's see, about 60 kids, the more listeners I have, the easier the flow of the night goes. We have a couple people in place for that, but I would love to have more. Um, even if it's, you know, just for the month of October, I want to I want to be a listener for our kids. That would be great. You can come see me or email me at jennifer at crosslinkcares.org. This is, this is something parents are looking for, for for their kids and for themselves, and I want Crosslink to be able to support that with any parent. So let's get those kids off the wait list and come see me if, if that's something God's put on your heart. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. Carry the message with you and share God's love with others. Bye. Thank you.